Yo, what's up, family? This is Live Tech One hollering at my man Patty Lane on WordIsBond.com. Future shop for you. The question is there's a lot of references to enlightenment and a higher power in my music and how would I define my own spirituality clearly you know that could be like a, a book just to explain it but I'm gonna simplify it for the sake of this interview what goes around comes around do unto others as you would have them do unto you love your neighbor as you love yourself that's how I define my spirituality I stand on the square of truth because I understand the truth brings freedom, justice, and equality to all the human families and without universal truth, not personal truth, you know, not what's true for a select group, but what's true for the cosmos, which is a different level of truth. There's a higher frequency and a more pure form of truth. I stand on that square and I live my life to fulfill my divine purpose, meaning divine meaning the origin of all things being infinite and everything is finite. So within that divine purpose, you know, my form follows my function. I was made for a reason, so I seek to fulfill that purpose, which is to bring knowledge, wisdom, understanding, freedom, justice, and equality to all the human families on the planet Earth, starting with my own, which is the black man. But I also, you know, understand that every human being is connected to me as being a black man, the original human being, Every human being is just an extension of myself. But there are a lot of issues in this day and time. This is a wicked world, it's iniquitous. You know, the things that don't make sense are often presented as being right when they're wrong. You know, so I live by that principle of ma'at and truth and justice. And those are the things that I project through my music. Those are the things that I project through my daily life. And those are the things that I stand on. And that's my ethos, that's my way of life, that is my theology of time, knowing the time and what must be done in it. And that's the most simple way I can define my spirituality. I could easily go into like, you know, a dissertation to take it to a deeper level, elaborating on a lot of the confusion about the canons, you know, how some people argue about so-called Christianity, some people argue about Islam, some people argue about comedic science, some people argue about the Orisha, you know, all these different ideas. The thing that I always have um, come to understand is that seaweed and cactus are two different plants but according to their environment the seaweed fits where it's supposed to be its form follows its function at the bottom of the ocean it's a lot of pressure intense heavy weight from the water so the seaweed yields it is absorbent it allows itself to not break under the pressure of the water, but it actually absorbs the water and the nutrients that are in the water. Whereas when you have a cactus, it grows in a desert. And in that desert, there's an arid environment. There are predators that are looking for nourishment and water. So the cactus internalizes that nourishment and it protects itself with thorns. Now, if we try to use the model of a cactus in the environment of the bottom of the ocean, then it ain't gonna work. If we try to put the seaweed in the desert, it'll dry out and die. So the point being is that I believe and I understand form follows function. And what works for me may not work for you. But to understand that both of us have a purpose. Both of us have a function. And as individuals, if we seek that higher state of consciousness, which is basically connecting back to the source of all things. If we are both seeking that, we'll work together in harmony. Even if I'm in the desert or you're at the bottom of the ocean, we both grow from the soil up towards the sky. That's the elevation. So for me, that's that's pretty much what I consider my spirituality, you know, is freedom, justice, and equality. You know, it's not a matter of um, religious sects or uh, dogma. It's about understanding the science of life and the supreme wisdom and the theology of time. And that's what I represent. You know, I have compassion for all the human families. And at the same time, I understand that there's an iniquitous amount of human beings on this planet that work in opposition to creation. For me, it's more of an issue of just manifesting my purpose and fulfilling it as I exist in this paradigm of the physical plane. The question is, you know, like in my music, I talk about the Nile Valley civilizations and ancient Kemet. And 
what is it my fascination with that time period really for me it's not so much that time period it's an understanding that before chattel slavery began in this western hemisphere of the americas black people created a paradigm of civilization that has been used by everyone else on the planet earth the now valley was a stage of that elevation of civilization where we culminated everything we had prior to that going you know from the stone age all the way up to around 4500 BC, 3000 BC to the first dynasty of Kemet with Narmer or Menez. From, from that time frame, you know, you're looking at probably hundreds of thousands of years where the process of inventing a calendar, the process of defining astronomy to actually understand that certain stars appear at certain times of year. Mathematics to be able to actually count, to have finite mathematics to count from zero to nine. Like these things happen in the Nile Valley. This is the epicenter of all the human experience that we identify with this civilization now. These ideas of language, these ideas of spirituality, these ideas of science, agriculture, all these things came from the Now Valley. But we have to be honest with ourselves as human beings. There had to be somebody to do it first. Black folks in the Now Valley perfected so much of what we do today that we consider privilege and civilization. So the context for me to understand that is to understand myself as a black man to understand that my ancestors, the legacy they had, wasn't just one of strictly and exclusively art, but also intellect and being pioneers in so many areas of engineering, so many areas of science, so many areas of culture and government and you know the things that we now value. Um, it was very crucial and important for me as a black child growing up in the United States of America where chattel slavery had created so much propaganda to say that black people were basically monkeys and apes and we never did anything in Africa. You know, the whole understanding of Africa, you know, first of all, there is no country called Africa. That's a continent. The word Africa in itself is really the name of a Roman colony, which we now know as Tunisia. So that's a Roman word. There's no indigenous group of people that call themselves African. So for me, it was like a process of learning things like that to know that being a, a, a descendant of people that were enslaved here in the Americas, I had been taught lies. That's the only way that they could sustain slavery. You had to convince a man that he was a beast so that you would be able to control his mind and body to create whatever empire you wanted. You needed that free labor, and as long as his mind harkened back to a time before he was a slave, then he would be a problem. So they had to instill in black people to sustain their endeavors of capitalism, as it were. They had to instill a certain level of ignorance in us to cut us off from our origin. So, you know, reading things like David Walker's appeal in the 19th century, he mentioned things like our legacy in Egypt or Kemet, the Nile Valley. And he referred to the fact that we were the descendants of those same pharaohs. To historically frame it for you, people always talk about the Palmaic dynasties. That was much later. That had nothing to do with it. For me, the real emphasis is the Old Kingdom, the first six dynasties, which ended at approximately 2760 BC. Those Old Kingdom pharaohs began with Narmer or Menez, the unifier of the two lands. These are black people that look like me. And the end of their reign being the sixth dynasty, you had a succession of pharaohs that were, you know, what some people might consider mixed or mulatto, but they were a combination of indigenous black peoples from the continent of Africa, as well as peoples that were from Southwest Asia. And then eventually with the Palmaic dynasties, you had Greeks coming in and, you know, intermingling and creating patriarchal dynasties, which I don't consider real. It's like, you know, you can't say that you're a Native American just because you live in America now. You know, there's a difference. And understanding those legacies, it helps me see a better picture. My understanding of my people you know, I don't limit it just to the Nile Valley because, you know, the whole planet is ours. It's 23 million miles of useful land. We've been all over the planet. We were in the Americas. We were in Asia. You know, we've been everywhere on the planet Earth since its birth. So for me, it's understanding those kind of things, knowing the facts. question is, what books would I suggest for people? Because I have a lot of books in my library and a lot of the videos, you get a glimpse of some of the stuff that I've studied and read. 
my thing is, you know, reading is a tool. And what you study, whatever field, whether it be the physical sciences, whether it be metaphysics, whether it be anthropology, whether it be history, whether it be sociology, whether it be educational paradigms like, you know, Paulo Freire's engaged pedagogy or, you know, whether it be philosophy, you know, ideas like the Tao Te Ching, concepts of the art of war, whatever it is you read, to me it's more issue of understanding your purpose and then using the resources of information and the experiences of other human beings through literature to better enhance your ability to fulfill your purpose. So I don't give a generic book list to people to say, well, you should read this. Because if you're a kid that, you know, grew up in suburban white America and, you know, you have European parents, there is a lot of stuff that I've read that could benefit you, but you may need to understand something else. You may need to understand the history of anti-Semitism uh, as it relates to Voltaire. It's a book a guy wrote called The History of Anti-Semitism, and you realize the invention of race is reasonably new. It just happened like in the 15th, 16th century. It wasn't an ancient concept. So maybe that would benefit you, or maybe you would want to understand the nature of, you know, the Federal Reserve and how money is just an illusion. Or maybe if you're a kid from Asia, you want to understand the nature of how Asian civilization has evolved over thousands of years. You know, I can't say that every book I've read is going to benefit you. So I don't really, you know, project literature in that way. If we're going to have a field of study, if you study anthropology, if you want to study the Now Valley, if you want to study and understand the experience of black people and the, or the original people of the planet Earth, yeah, I got a great book list for you. But I think it's more important for each individual to know their purpose, understand what their objective is on this plane that we call life, uh, this physical existence, and seek to equip themselves to fulfill it. You might need to be reading books about nutrition. You might need to be reading books about biological sciences so you can come up with some cures to some diseases that plague humanity. You may need to be studying technology, reading books about you know mechanical engineering to come up with better ideas to build buildings for people to live in or bridges or you know whatever. So I don't really look at literature in a vacuum. I think it's contextual. Every person has a purpose. Um, that's why, you know, when you go to a university, there's different fields of study and we all have a place. I think form follows function and I think that if we have true scholarship, you know, not pseudo scholarship, not rhetoric, not just getting a bunch of information to back up an idea we already have, but if we're objective and we seek truth, universal truth, and we're willing to compare sources and to make sense out of the different things we study, whether it's the physical sciences, whether it's the philosophy, whatever it is, you know, I think it's the, the mindset, I think it's the perspective of purpose that validates literature in, when you study it. So I can't really give you um, a specific book list, you know, it, there's a lot of books that I've read and they cover a lot of different areas, so I don't limit myself and I wouldn't want to limit anyone else. I just feel like you need to have a purpose and you need to have an understanding of yourself and where you fit into this holistic context of humanity and the, and the omniverse. And then from that point, you know, I think it won't be as hard to figure out what type of literature you should seek. If you want to get at me, go check Lab Tech One on Facebook and ask me about a topic or subject and then I'll give you my input. But just as far as general book list, I say it's more important that at least you're reading, begin the process, keep an open mind, check the sources of the things you read. Everything you read is not real. Sometimes you have to really do the research on who wrote what you're reading and then compare it to other sources in that related topic. That applies to the physical sciences as well as metaphysical. So that's my take on reading and you know the book list thing.